Want to grab a beer? The boss is out anyway. Sure. But this time you're paying. Killing Private Ant. Here's an unobtrusive reminder to do something under the video. To understand why the U.S. is dropping hundreds of thousands of flies on ants, you first need to get to know the ants themselves. We came from the south, from the hot lands of South America. In the 1930s, we were carried to new shores with the soil people loaded onto their ships. We sat patiently in the dark of the holds until we caught a new scent, the scent of America. Our first step was in Mobile, Alabama. No one was waiting for us there, and no one could stop us. Here we have no enemies. Here there's far too much food. We spread, expanded our lands, crept into pastures, fields, and cities. Now we number in the billions. Painful bites and a nasty temper make us dangerous to people, livestock, pets, and wild animals. Our colony is always on the move and always hungry for protein. We'll devour anything alive that can't run or fly away in time. We don't just bite, we inject venom. This cricket's got a tough exoskeleton, but its jaw joints and belly are easy targets, and that's why it's doomed. No armor in the insect world can hold us back for long. But insects aren't the only prey. Fire ants don't even spare calves. Ants love open sunny pastures where it's easy to build their hidden traps. Hay and grassy spots are especially attractive for these insects. That's where they wait to strike at the slightest touch of the trap. Usually, ants attack the whole colony at once. The moment the victim flinches from the first very painful bite, they go all in. Newborn calves are especially vulnerable. Ants sting the soft, moist tissues, including the eyes, targeting spots with thin or no fur, ears, face, belly. First, they sink their mandibles into the prey's flesh to get a grip. Then they stab it with a sting like a syringe and inject venom, and they do it repeatedly. These wounds often lead to a quick death. Every year, more than $5 billion are spent on treatment, control, and damage compensation from fire ants in infested areas, and their numbers keep growing. Their population in the U.S. is now five to ten times bigger than in their native South America, mainly because they have no natural enemies and plenty of prey. Fire ants sting fast and multiple times in a row. Their venom causes severe swelling and can kill small animals within hours. Mass attacks are especially dangerous. The victim just doesn't have time to escape. But what's scarier is that ants aren't just dangerous to living creatures. They crawl into electrical panels, chew on wires, and short-circuit connections with their bodies. This causes short circuits, sparks, and fires. Sometimes ants even cause harm to people. In 2001, we found a vulnerable one. 73-year-old Earl in the Atlantic Shores nursing home in Florida. He was recovering from surgery, and at night we crawled onto his bed. After a few hundred bites and 40 hours, he died from shock. The venom did its job. His back, arms, chest, neck, and head were covered with our bites. Also, a man walking his dog stepped on our anthill. He managed to get to the hospital, but the anaphylactic shock was too much for him to handle. According to statistics, about a third of people in infected areas suffer ant bites every year. Forehead flies are a large family of two-winged insects, counting about 4,000 species. Some of them are pretty plain and look like fruit flies, but over 70 species have earned the title flies that decapitate ants. They belong to the genus Pseudactean and are considered the main enemies of fire ants. It's in their nature. After mating, the females immediately look for a host to lay their eggs. They need a fire ant. The fly quickly lands on it and in a split second lays eggs using a sharp ovipositor. The egg turns into a larva and feeds on the hemolymph while the ant goes about its usual life. Then the larva migrates into the ant's head and eats the jaw muscle and other tissues. The ant is still alive until the larva releases an enzyme that dissolves the membrane between the ant's head and its body, and the head falls off. Inside the severed head, the larva pupates and turns into an adult fly, and then the cycle repeats. Forehead flies attack only fire ants and don't pose a threat to other ant species or mammals. Because of this narrow specialization, they will always follow their victims. Just one infection is enough, and the colony starts to die out. 
Not long ago, the ants were ruthless hunters scouring the area for food. They even took down large animals, but now, infected by flies, they suddenly abandon their prey. Within minutes, they completely stop searching for food. The infected ants return to the nests, and life inside slowly comes to a halt. Work stops, nest building ceases, whole groups of insects stop following their instincts. At first, the infected ant might act like usual, working hard, bringing food, taking care of others, but its brain is already dead. Inside its head wriggles a hungry larva. It feeds on the brain tissue while the host keeps going through its usual motions for another 8 to 10 hours, like a puppet. The parasitic fly controls the ant so it doesn't raise any suspicion among its mates. What's wrong with him? Seems like he's working, but for some reason he's reinforcing the wall when he's supposed to be watching the eggs. Only when the larva reaches maturity does the ant's behavior suddenly change. It leaves the nest and starts wandering aimlessly, like a zombie, until it gets far enough away. The distance is needed so the fly can pupate away from the nest. It's safer that way. And then, decapitating. After a while, the adult fly crawls out. In fact, it's not far from the doomed colony full of potential victims. The cycle repeats over and over. And now the colony won't get any peace. Even one fly among 200 foragers can cut their numbers and have their food haul in just six weeks. What if there are several flies? For almost three decades now, forid flies have been bred for release into the southern states overrun by fire ants. All this is part of a biological control initiative. The fire ant fighting campaign has been a part of a long-running program involving various agricultural services. The program had a humble beginning. Since 1997, a federal research lab in Gainesville was breeding about a thousand and a half flies a day. That was only enough for two or three batches a month. It took decades to get fly breeding up to the level where they could be parachuted onto ants. Larger facilities from the Horticultural Science Department joined in. The volume doubled. According to the scientists, they plan to expand production and send batches of flies beyond Florida. For now, researchers have found that these parasites can reduce the number of worker ants in a colony by 10 to 15 percent. But wiping out the red fire ants using just flies isn't easy. In Argentina, the decapitation process happens naturally. But down in the southern U.S., finding the perfect fly species for the local fire ants has proven more difficult. The parasite's specialization is indeed really narrow. When we start releasing forward flies, it turns into a full-on military operation. First, we physically throw the anthill off balance, slice off the top, flip it over, and flatten the dirt. That instantly sends the ants into panic and aggression. They rush outside, trying to defend their nest. A specific pheromone smell fills the air, the colony's alarm signal. For us, it's a cue that the ants are up and vulnerable. That same scent attracts forward flies, which we let loose from special containers. At a time, we can set free dozens, hundreds, or in big operations from two to 20,000 flies. They take to the air, break into swarms, and swoop down on the ants. Each fly singles out a victim and swiftly plunges its ovipositor into the ant's body, all in a matter of seconds. Sometimes we work in a different way. We trap ants, infect them with parasites in the lab, and then return them to the nest. It's like sitting in Trojan horses. They do the job of spreading the parasites through the colony. The battle with fire ants is a long siege. For two to four weeks, we hit the same target with repeated waves of attacks, letting the flies loose over and over until the anthill collapses and the colony's wiped out. This method demands time, patience, and accuracy. Without that, there's no success. This army was originally put together far from the U.S. in Brazil and Argentina. That's where the first forward flies were caught, and later their mass breeding was set up in Gainesville, Florida, at facilities run by the Department of Agriculture. Inside large ventilated boxes with controlled temperature live both the flies and their future prey, fire ants. The ants are kept in a row of trays, each with two upside-down cups. One cup is raised, the other lowered and every 10 minutes they switch places. The ants are forced to keep moving their larvae under the cups, and during this time, their alarm pheromones attract the flies. The flies attack. The panicked ants release even more pheromones. A vicious cycle. The stronger the attack, the more new flies flock to the scent. Every morning, new flies ready to parasitize are released into the attack chamber. They get three to four days to hunt, after which the surviving ants are removed and new batches take their place. 
That's how the scientists build their winged army. When it's time to send the flies on a mission, a whole logistical operation kicks in. They're gently coaxed out of their work chambers into a roomy cage filled with sunlight. The flies head toward the bright exit and end up in a trap. From there, they're moved into clear plastic tubes about the length of a hand. One end is sealed with mesh, the other with a damp cotton pad so the insects don't dry out on the way. Just enough cotton's used to keep the moisture from turning into condensation. Each such capsule holds several hundred fighters, usually three to four hundred flies, ready to tackle at least ten ant mounds a day. The tubes are loaded into portable coolers and taken to the front. The drop-off happens every day, in the afternoon, as long as the weather holds. Sometimes it lasts a week, sometimes two, until the flies run out. Then scientists check how well forward flies can handle ants. Usually this is done with simple traps made from sticky tape, pizza dividers, and petri dishes. For example, entomologist Sanford Porter from the U.S. Department of Agriculture found that in areas with lots of fire ants, the chances of spotting these flies reaches 90%. The flies were even found outside the zones where they were originally released. This means the flies have not only settled in, but are also spreading quickly. No, there's no need to worry about them taking over the country. The same Dr. Sanford Porter, former head of the Fly Breeding Center, has often been asked about the fate of the flies. People usually want to know what will happen to the parasites if fire ants finally disappear. And here, there's really only one possible answer. They'll simply die. Flies may not seem like the most obvious ant killers. After all, there are ant eaters. That should be their job. But in reality, it's not that simple. Anteaters may eat ants, but they can't wipe out an entire colony. They never reach the main target, the queen. Besides, they're not so ravenous as to clean out an anthill completely. Anteaters live only in Central and South America. There are none in North America. So releasing anteaters here could mean a serious risk of creating a new problem, introducing an invasive species that won't die off once the ants are gone. Armadillos could have been an option, but they've got the same problems. They don't eat enough and can't wipe out a colony. On top of that, armadillos themselves are seen as pests to people. So flies were chosen instead. They're natural killers of fire ants in their native South America and are a perfect fit for the fight in North America. But there are other methods too. To fight fire ants, special baits are used. Forager ants collect them and carry them throughout the colony. After a few weeks, this leads to its destruction. Helicopters help spread the bait. They drop it over large and hard to reach areas. Around 80% of the bait in such operations is dispersed from the air. The bait looks like grainy mulch, but ants find it irresistible. At the same time, the risk for other animals and the environment is minimal. The bait contains the same active ingredients found in regular pest control products, but in much smaller doses. Any mammal would have to eat more bait than its own body weight to get poisoned, but it really does work on ants. This proven method is both effective and reliable. Helicopters can cover areas unreachable for ground crews, wiping out insects even in the most hard-to-reach spots. The key is speed. When new ant nests are found, crews move in right away, stopping the ants from spreading. To keep things under control, they set up a three-mile buffer zone. Fire ants can travel that far if they're not stopped. Gradually, drones are taking the place of helicopters. They do the same jobs, but the cost of operations is much lower and the drones themselves are more affordable than helicopters. To find new ant nests, trained dogs are also used. They're taught to recognize the distinct smell of the ants and their colonies. Ground crews with dogs sweep miles of land, hunting down even the tiniest fire ants. Sniffer dogs are considered the most effective tool for spotting these insects. They can pick up their scent from as far as 164 feet away. They're mainly used after treating the areas. This is to make sure the ants are really gone. And last year, an interdisciplinary research team came up with a new way to detect fire ant nests using a robot dog and artificial intelligence. Field tests showed that this system finds three times more colonies and with much greater accuracy than humans. All these ant control methods are used successfully in Australia, a country where the fire ant problem is a serious one. And even though the fight against ants there started not so long ago, Australia's isolation forces them to use every tool available. Florida could use that experience too. Although the flies don't completely wipe out the fire ants, they do cut down their activity and aggression. They lower it enough so that the local ant species get a chance to push out the invaders. 
Over many years of the program, the forehead flies have firmly settled across large parts of the southeastern U.S. By 2008, they covered about 50% of the quarantine zone affected by fire ants. By 2011, one species was already found in almost 65% of that zone and the other in nearly 90%. By 2012 to 2013, the second species had spread across the entire quarantine area. You could call that a win. Yeah, we came from the south, but we've spread out in North America stronger than anywhere else. We don't have any enemies here. Flies came along to try and keep us in check. They stick right on our tails. But even they can't stand up to our army. Today, we've taken over about 346 million acres of land. On every 2.5 acres, there are up to 60 of our nests. In each nest, hundreds of thousands of workers. We keep multiplying nonstop. Several times a year, millions of queens fly off starting new colonies. They think they're controlling us, but it's just a break. We're here. We're always close by. And this isn't the end yet. See you later.